Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Lecture 5 in the course on folklore studies and in this lecture we would see as to how the idea of binaries has been at the core of anthropological and sociological engagement with folklore. We all know that anthropology and folklore are seen as distinct disciplines that are entirely separated from one another or so do we think and they are not as we know from the intellectual history of these disciplines that sociology and anthropology have always been in, as, in association with the resources of knowledge which come from society. Someone like uh, Darnell in, uh, in an observation sometime in 1973 traced the development of both the disciplines of anthropology and folklore in the United States and in the United States she noted the influence and role of most eminent anthropologist of United States, uh, Professor Franz Boas, who was responsible for the growth of anthropology in North America. Her review of the history of anthropology and folklore opens up the discussion on history of folklore between the years of 1890 to 1920. Reg Na, Regna Darnell had put forth the argument that Boas regarded the development of folklore was also a part of anthropology. This was not a smooth patch of journey. It is known that during its early years anthropology aimed at studying the exotic and folklore was exotic. Thus Boas also concentrated more on the myths that were collected from the indigenous people about them. This was in contradiction to the folklorists however, who aimed towards collecting folklore of different people of the continent, thereby making the discipline more holistic. They included the old English, Negro, American, American Indian, French Canadian and Mexican cultures. Boas, Franz Boas and his students earned respect from the field of folklore studies for their efforts and interest in this domain. The fear of disappearance of the indigenous people caused this interest as we can recall from a couple of lectures in the very beginning of this course that similar kind of apprehension was also at the core of the advent of folklore studies to begin with in Germany. It was thought that the natives of a place would soon get assimilated into newer cultures thereby not, not re retaining any existing cultural elements. The folklorists were taking similar efforts. The accurate collection of materials of study was thus important. American folklore thus owes its emergence and growth to Franz Boas who strived to record the collected first hand materials and set forth high professional standards for folklore documenting and research. The studies were then given due space in the Journal of American Folklore that was also edited by Franz Boas himself. The trend of recording and documenting the myths of the indigenous people gained momentum. Here it is very important to keep repeating that it is all about the intersection of folklore studies and anthropology on one hand and anthropological intellectual interest in a particular kind of subject and the content of folklore on another. Boas was concerned with the general implications of myth themes, their diffusion, psychological reality and functional integration within cultures. All of these being questioned not raised by, uh, uh, raised by anthropologists earlier. These pioneering efforts served the purpose of recording and maintaining folklore traditions of cultures that were changing with that time. The defining characteristic of an anthropologist and folklorist is that the former describes a community with an unchanging past while the latter seeks to explain and highlight this static past. 
It would be an understatement, however, to emphasize the necessity of trying the two strands, tying the two strands together in order to gain a holistic understanding of culture and folklore that many societies with the Indian folklore uh, we come across. Nepalese folklore lacks uh, as of now. Um, anthropology has been considered more uh, fashionable than folklore after Levi Strauss' statement, according to which it is more general and more theoretical discipline. Anthropology deals with the man in general, whereas ethnology and folklore deal with cultures in plural. Cultural performances, therefore, comes very close to what ethnologists would like to do. Every cultural performance not only creates and carries texts, it is a text. There exists major contribution of anthropology to folklore studies that should be recognized. The engagement with these cultural practices and myths become a backbone of anthropology which also adds to the knowledge resource base of folklore studies. The folklore traditions do not exist without a context. Thus, the usage of anthropological method and theories come handy while understanding, analyzing and exploring folklore in any given society at any given point of time. The polity, ecology, society are some of such aspects of folklore studies that have benefited immensely through anthropology. Anthropology's in-depth fieldwork methodology, long engagement in question of society, cultural interactions and broad holistic view of society yields valuable insights into folklore and cultural change. Yet, the discipline's voice in folklore debates has remained a relatively marginal one until now. However, anthropological knowledge, anthropological lens enriches and deepens contemporary understanding of folklore. Anthropologists are also aware of the vitality of folklore studies in daily life and thus giving its due, it, its due importance in academic practices. However, some challenges seem to remain constant. The question of defining folklore seems to be one of such challenges in the domain of social sciences. For, as it seems, social scientists cannot afford to operate without a crystal clear definition, no matter whether that definition or that act of defining scuttles the progress, intellectual progress altogether. According to Dan Ben Amos, anthropologists tend to lump folklore with literature while scholars of literature see it as, it as culture. The complexities of the challenges still remain unresolved. The cultural whole within which collected folklore needs to be tied is vast. The effort has to be done in a way that folklore does not remain some negligible trivia. Folklorists have circumvented the main issue, namely the isolation of unifying thread that joins jokes and myths, gestures and legends, costumes and music into a single category of knowledge. And this is something we realize with Ben Amos. The first university to add a department devoted to the study of folklore was the University of Indiana in 1949. Despite continuous efforts, the growth of folklore studies was not so great. While anthropology was being set up in, the most, in most of the universities, the department to study folklore was still few. One of the leading scholars of the field which who I have referred to just now, Dan Ben Amos, gave us a critical history of folklore studies in United States and he noted folklore scholarship did not succeed in many respects in avoiding the pitfalls of method that are analogous to mere chronicling. Mere chronicling is probably not sufficient to make sense of the length and breadth the depth to be very precise of folklore. This is to say that the data collection could lack vigor, 
and standard in most of the folklore chronicling exercise. However, the analysis and usage of this collected data was still a bit fuzzy without clarity. It had not succeeded where Franz Boas had left off close to a half a century earlier and the theories that predominated in folklore research had been borrowed from other disciplines from anthropology to psychology. Folklore scholarship cited extensively scholars from other disciplines while they were in turn largely ignored by other scholars. It is then obvious that you know folklore scholarship was quickly becoming obsolete for a variety of reasons, some of the reasons mentioned just now. On the other hand, nature of folklore is such that it is always dynamic and that dynamism requires more interdisciplinary approaches than a mere chronicling by folklorist or vacuous definition vending by anthropologist. However, the two the folklore studies and anthropology are symbiotic in relation as far as understanding folklore is concerned. The existence of social is crucial to understanding folklore that exists in a social space and is connected with social beings and include social elements of everyday life. The socio-cultural narratives form folklore and the disciplines together can help in describing folklore as something that is not static. The older existing folklore can thus be studied in conjunct conjunction with the latest versions and we would take up some of these issues as we move ahead in this course particularly toward the end of the course we will more concretely discuss this. And we would also realize that the seeking of purity amidst, uh, amidst uh, folklore past or present remains to be a futile activity because the purity is yet to be understood in order to understand folklore at conjunction of various epochs in human history. The continuously changing and dynamic nature of folklore makes any collection completely pure as well as a fallible entity. There exists a two way relationship between folklore and literature, literature and other new media draw upon folklore and vice versa. The folklore as it exists today does not exist in sol solitary form only as a face to face interaction. Mediums of television, internet, emails are also sources through which folklore passes on and gets recorded. This nexus is becoming strong with time and is a crucial space for folklore. The contemporary culture and past folklore are intertwined. The disciplines of anthropology and folklore can thus learn and contribute from each other though their methods and methodology through their methods and methodology. The common people often understood as the peasants, the uneducated, the lower income groups were considered as the folk within the Victorian period. It was the inherited wisdom and expressions that the constructed that they constructed the art of lore. The definition gradually grew with time it came to encompass interaction and artistic communication by an by any one in a group. Thus by 20th century the term folklore became a vast domain that pointed towards expressive traditions. Its emergence and development came to limelight so to say. The human practices that were often repeated came to be regarded as part of tradition and thus were deemed to fall into the category of folk life studies. Folk culture has a peculiar characteristic of being participatory. Its variable nature distinguishes it from popular culture. 
Given this whole complication about folklore and its changing nature, fieldwork forms the major cornerstone of folklore studies just like cultural or social anthropology. It is another thing, another story that the Japanese folklore studies are about Japanese researchers researching and studying themselves. This is what distinguishes them from anthropological approaches which include researchers studying other societies as well. Japanese folklore studies thus in simple words mean self-study of their own culture. Intensive and extensive fieldwork forms the backbone of social and cultural anthropological studies along with research of the culture that is being studied. The theoretical analysis is inevitable. These studies were not simply about just one culture or just one point of time. They are more comprehensive and they aim at bringing about a holistic study of a larger society and that of mankind. For instance, Malinowski with his theory of functionalism in 1920s and 30s brought about major changes in the way of understanding society and evolutionary anthropology that began in Great Britain. It was Claude Lévi-Strauss uh, structuralism in the 1950s and 60s that again had a huge influence over social sciences and its disciplines. Clifford Geards began to focus on cultural symbols in the 1970s and 1980s giving impetus to interpretative anthropology. These are various stages in anthropology which receives theoretical conceptual churning by the virtue of these new contributions being made and that, a, that adds to the larger corpus of anthropological imagination. The meanings became important and it eventually led us to something we are, we are familiar with as writing culture debate. Clifford, Marcus and others were part of this debate and they were basically trying to understand as to how there is poetics and politics involved in ethnographic practices which eventually amounts to anthropological writing, anthropological monograph, ethnographic monograph. They tried showing the cult in the, uh, the, uh, that the cultural interpretation, the act of interpretation has is fraught with power. The idea of cultural critique was thus introduced and that analyzed the effectiveness of conveying meanings. All these development in anthropology are linked to concepts, various kind of concepts. So, for example, gift exchange, lineage, diaspora, so and so forth. Cultural and social anthropology have consistently contributed to building a common theoretical foundation for the world and to understand the world at large. Folklore has been part of human society since time immemorial, almost a truism, especially true for tribal culture. Tribal society is defined by its culture that includes the heritage, agriculture and it is the folklore that transmits all of these. Folklore can be seen as concentrating and studying one's own national heritage that becomes a part of cultural anthropology. It is rare for any society to exist without having its own folklore, so and so forth. The point however is to not get lost in the wordy platitude and series of obviousness, truism that has been coming to us through various channels time and again through scholarship as well as non-scholarly channels like popular platforms and even state machineries. The point however is to understand as to how our engagement with folklore could, could get more nuanced and here what is being offered is to suggest that anthropological interventions in understanding folklore and folklore related dynamics, social reality makes our understanding more nuanced and also provides us, more importantly provides us ample scope for generating arguments which are otherwise absent in folklore, discussions on folklore. One of the most fascinating arts of being a folklorist is confronting the questions 
our disciplines evoke from outside world and creates from its own dynamics. And the question is what is that we do? What is the stuff we collect? These questions have started appearing in the decade of 1990s in various parts of the world. Several folklores help to answer these questions. They also pave the way for innovating various kind of approaches. Comparative approach towards studying human nature is certainly helpful in understanding folklore studies. Even a single folk tale or a story can have different and unique variations within the same region. The variations are context specific as well as people specific. Music and dance act as a major source in building up folklore of any group or any region. For instance, the Nevari people of Nepal generally use the medium of masked dancing in order to express their stories and belief system. There exists mountains, rivers, deserts, oases, planetary system, everything can form a part of folklore as we see in the case of Nevar. There remains strange and unbelievable myths and legends about Nepalese folk that get reflected in their stories. We may find them bizarre, we may call them bizarre myths coming from the Nevari folklore in Nepal. But then the bizarreness is also a sign of the richness, so to say. Hindu folklore in Nepal, for example, on why the stone shaligram, which is in a scientific term called ammonite fossils, why the stone shaligram or tulsi basil plant and the people, banyan tree, are sacred? How would one explain it? Folklore of yeti the mysterious creature of mountain, how to explain it? Hindu fo uh, folklore discussing Lord Ganesha and one can ask why Lord Ganesha is elephant headed, how to explain it? A lot of cognitive materials explanations come from folklore no doubt, but then one also have to bring it to the domain of critical inquiry and connect it with history, state, politics, economy to see whether these the answers to these questions could make larger sense. Questions such as folklore on why Seti river flow partly underground at Pokhran and how did Kali make deepest gorge. Nepali king who believed that he was immortal, why, how? Himalayan myth on snow leopards, all of these could find more nuances when the explanation coming from folklore could be brought together with the explanation coming from anthropology and for that matter various other disciplines in social science. There exist several folklores which open up different stories to the audience. Some of such folklore could uh, be found from various contexts, from various cultural contexts. One from Nepal suggests that there exists reasons behind the sacredness of the stone shaligram ammonite fossils. The powerful demon Birat Sura in the earliest times was apparently the most ruthless and merciless demon who used to kill common people. Even the powerful and revered gods like Lord Shiva could not fight him. They could uh, not have emerged victorious. However, the killing of Birat Sura was required at any cost. He had the blessing of not dying until the chastity of his wife, Brinda, was maintained. Once this was known, Lord Vishnu disguised himself as Birat Sura and violated Brinda's chastity. He succeeded in his mission and Birat Sura was consequently killed. Brinda was infuriated on this and cursed Vishnu to be transformed into a stone, plant and tree. Shaligram, Tulsi and people 
are the personified versions of this and are thus considered sacred. There could be an explanation coming from all these questions from folklore, but one always seeks for something more than the folkloric explanation that is where something like anthropology, sociology, politics, performance studies, these approaches become very important. Folklore then becomes a way of representing a culture that is established over time. Various cultural and social institutions are managed through this form of interaction. Identities are continuously constructed and reconstructed as well as stability is sought in order to keep the social machinery intact. It is generally imagined that the folk are the people who are different and kept apart from what is happening in the larger global world. However, this too has gone through revision. This is where scholarship becomes faulty in this kind of perception. The folk are in fact quite aware of the situations and thus their contemporary nature of being should be acknowledged. Way back, an eminent folklorist like A.K. Ramanujan made it very clear to us, a proverb such as, it is dark under the lamp in Kannada has been collected in Kannada and in Kashmiri at two ends of the Indian subcontinent. The sentence is the same in each place, but it means different things. The reference is the same, but the sense is different. In Kannada, it means that a virtuous man like a lighted lamp may have dark hidden vices. In Kashmiri, one gets to see, one gets to know that it is dark under the lamp has a political sense that a good natured king may have evil counsellors. This is of course characteristic of cultural forms. Folk renditions of the pan-Indian epics and myths not only bring the gods home, making the daily world mythic, they also contemporize them, they also make them contemporary. In village enactments of the epic Ramayan, in various Ram Leelas, when Sita has to choose her bridegroom, princes from all over the universe appear as suitors. In a North Indian folk version, an Englishman with a pith a helmet, a solar hat and a hunting rifle regularly appears as one of the suitors of Sita. After all, since the 18th century, the English have been a powerful presence in India and ought to have a place in any epic bridegroom choice or Swayamvara. Folklore of Russia like most other places highlighted the past events, the Russian cultural, sociocultural context. This knowledge of the past is reproduced through existing folklore. Each generation passes on knowledge to its succeeding generation in the form of folklore. Several constructs of theorists, thinkers and social scholars are in fact broken through these folklore. The folk are generally more aware, sensitive and intelligent than assumed by the literati. Thus folklore not only helps in constructing society, sometimes it helps in deconstructing society too. It can be seen as a more nuanced way of unraveling a history that might have been overshadowed by popular narratives. The bulk of scholarship in Japan is based on its folklore studies. Folklore comprised not only of folk tales, but included um, rituals, livelihoods, childbirth, childcare, funeral, funeral, 
issues of family, graves, kinship, so on. The scope of Japanese folk studies is thus vast. This rich depository of works help in constructing the folk narrative of Japan quite extensively, unlike other countries where the scope of folklore studies remained quite limited. The broad range of folklore studies made it comparable to disciplines of cultural and social anthropology. The heavy emphasis on the wide range of folklore is what distinguished the folklore studies in Japan to that of other places. Historically, the Japanese folklore studies developed with continuous interaction and exchange with other disciplines. The research findings of folklore studies were there also led to explaining anthropological studies of Japan and thus significant references in research and analysis we find. Nepal like other regions depend on these things for its quite unique cultural heritage to be depicted through folklore. The traditions of ethnic cultures, subcultures, various groups then gets space to get represented within the larger society. Nepali folklore established relationship of local people with their culture, ethnocognition using folklore for interaction and unity, for managing social, cultural, ecological situations in various institutional settings, for identity making, explaining the natives as possessing an exclusive system of perceiving and organizing phenomenon. The Nepali folklore according to various scholars have gained a lot due to anthropological methodology of intensive field work and continuous range of questioning and, re, uh, and uh, the belief system that is reiterated through folklore plays a major role in, big, in, in bringing about crucial insights regarding different aspects. For example, several ecological concerns get answered in folklore. The ecological conservation practices in Nepal for example draw a lot from their local folklore. Gazing into belief systems is instrumental in ascertaining the collective unconscious of a group that is the underlying values of a culture, ambitions, their uncertainties, fears, motivation and morals. They represent collective and inherited patterns of thought in the form of folklore. Oral narratives are significant in constructing social anthropology as well as folklore studies. Oral history becomes an important pillar then for supporting both the disciplines. Folklore in Nepal like many other places thrived on a mix of amalgamation, uh, a mix of uh, tradition, traditional with the modern. Historically it is very important to see such mixes. Folklore studies also help by adding to the methods of anthropological research their own viewpoint. The study of folklore within the, within the vast field of anthropology cannot be said to be static therefore, it has changed over time. Anthropologists find it necessary to find ways and methods to highlight the diffusion of, early, of earlier folklore, the old folklore with more contemporary beliefs and tales. However, it is also important for them to understand the fact that folklore had always believed in this diffusion or folklore always has been spontaneously of this kind that it diffuses and therefore was never, it never stagnated. There was a continuous mix of older beliefs with more recent developments. Inno innovation had been a key factor for folklore. Uh, in, in, in the realm of folklore and therefore, the scholars who are looking at it ought to be sensitive to, the, to that uh, feature of folklore. And therefore, it becomes futile task almost to search for purity in fo folklore, the diffusion of past with everything that is contemporary makes this difficult and in fact unnecessary. This becomes much more complex with the interaction of society and various mediums such as television 
or internet or various platforms of similar kinds including radio, print mediums. Communities tend to construct stories and folk culture according to the prevalent culture, cult, uh, medium, media culture that is being showcased through such mediums. The idea of face to face storytelling has gradually become archaic. New forms like internet, emails are setting up new trends in folklore studies. One can find now therefore, problem with the older approach to folklore. Say for example, Fisher argued that understanding spirit possession, spirit possession which was very typical of a lot of folk context. Understanding spirit possession as a phenomenon necessarily entailed understanding the context in which it is spoken of or told about spirits in the hills of Nepal particularly. One cannot linger long in Nepal without becoming aware of the complex interactions among manifold varieties of spirit and humans. Attached to, to, to various kind of offerings, possession and cures and various kind of reinterpretations. And hence, Nepali folklore and stories are typically based upon reality and religious belief with narration on gods, demons, ghosts, animals, love and war and so on. But one also has to add in this whole thing, not only in the context of Nepal, but probably even elsewhere applicable that this all comes in interaction with the contemporary, with the contemporary milieu contemporary environment of mediated communication. In the context of urban landscape, since one would find folklore in urban landscape too in the changing situation, unlike earlier anthropological engagement with folklore which tried to seek for folklore in primitive society and later peasant society, agricultural society, li uh, non-literate societies one also has to come to the urban landscape and in the context of urban landscape, though apart from civil war sites and colonial hinterlands, one can examine the way that urban landscape gave rise to urban legends or stories about the perceived dangers and tensions of urban communities such as competition for resources, warfare and economic differentiation perceive the landscape is therefore to carry out an act of remembrance and remembering is not so much a matter of calling up an internal image stored in the mind as of engaging perceptually with an environment that is itself pregnant with the past. Tim Ingold, the anthropologist of space gives us this powerful insightful idea which connects folklore with urbanity, contemporariness and summons different kind of anthropological sensitivity in order to understand them. If one can argue that landscapes and folklore are so entangled, then it can be argued that the stories people tell about landscapes are vital to the way people organize their physical surroundings and the ways in which people organize themselves within these surroundings. The landscape enfolds, enfolds the lives and times of predecessors who over the generations have moved around in it and played their part in its formation. Tim in gold in 1993 very rightly remarked that stories are a way to open up the world and not to cloak it. Folk tales and stories are a strong medium to express the world in a manner that is interesting to all. Landscape is so important that even political inequality defined in terms of privileged access for ruling groups to the economic, symbolic and social resources must be realized in physical space through separations, barriers and prohibitions. Landscape is often used as a symbol to discuss this, this folklore in detail. 
landscape creates perception and helps in transmitting the required story. For Tim Ingold also, landscape is not mere piece of land or simply some water or just an aspect of nature. He in fact defines this quite aptly where he regards landscape as a cultural image, a pictorial way of representing or symbolizing surroundings. Thus, it is a people who give meaning or various meanings to a particular landscape. This meaning then becomes accepted when transmitted through cultural narratives among different people by themselves. Through stories and tales of landscape there exists a possibility and potential of using folklore and depicting relations in a delicate, informed and interesting manner. The 21st century saw emergence and expansion of digitization. The pre-digital ideas of folklore were being revised by the folklorists in order to make the face-to-face -face communication viable for global transmission through services like that of internet and cyber culture. The vernacular practices were thus put on a digital platform. The umpteen number of textbooks and websites as platform for beginning scholarship of fol folklore. This can be both within national boundaries as well as scholarship extending the boundaries. The oral genres remain a central art of these texts. However, the summations also include social and cultural situations and conditions thereby making folklore a larger umbrella term. The texts discuss and describe a vast range of categories that become identity markers in any society. Ethnicity, religion, occupation, region, sexuality, etc. are among others. Other uh, are many, are some of them, uh, some of some among many others such categories. Different scholars have described and understood folklore in this way in this kind of wake of new development. And many of them have also tried to develop folkloristic methodology in this novel situation. Performative, the idea of performative becomes central in this wake. One begins to see that it is no longer just simple case of voice being heard, it is a little more than voice being heard, there is some kind of cultural dynamics in the way voicing happens and equally important kind of cultural dynamics loaded with epistemological significance in the way those voices are heard. The new mediums of technology become crucial. One has to deal with these new technologies in order, to, in order to understand the complication in the act of hearing, feeling, touching in the large hermeneutic apparatus that one has employed in order to understand. An innovative approach towards understanding contemporary folklore is be, has become the latest buzzword amongst various folklorists and anthropologists. One has also seen some of the instances of analysis of emails, emails which are forwarded by one another and the ways in which they served to define conservative social identity in the United States. And they described these forwarded emails as political digital folklore with the emails being sent generally having visual images presenting President Barack Obama as an anti-American. The visual folklore is thus a kind of digital folklore that is politically motivated showing how their political dynamics may contribute to constructing not only group identity but also the individual's social identity within their email group. The dynamic nature of folklore leads to continuous growth of the of new folklore. A lot of these would be discussed in the last lecture in this course, 
where we would try to understand the significance of this novelty attached to the folklore. However, here we are just trying to flag some of those issues which will reappear in the last lecture. This does not mean that old folklore should be discarded or could be discarded or has been discarded. That remains equally important. The collected folklore of the past is a crucial tool that helps in shedding light over the contemporary existence of communities and living practices. Every group, community, society, nation, culture has its own gamut of folklore. Russia comes across as a modern urban nation. However, this does not deprive it of having culture of its own folklore and folk belief. Larger spiritual understanding of culture and its people also depend on an engagement with folklore. One can classify and analyze those, those materials along scientific lines. The belief like the gifts that must not be giver over the door sill nor the hands that must not be shook over this same liminal space are interesting to gain larger understanding of society. The Russian websites can be a space where dreams are shared and analyzed online. It is interesting to understand if these, these materials are also joining the panorama of folklore. Is this not folklore one should ask? Is this not calling upon collective beliefs to interpret the events of the present? Is there not some continuity between the folklore of the past and the beliefs of the present? Of course, one has to have that longe dure perspective to arrive at a more sustainable analysis. When we look at texts this way, we can modify terms such as great and little traditions and see all these performances as transitive series, a scale of forms, a phrase in a different context from someone like Collingwood, responding to one another. Past and present was pan-Indian and was local. All these things would succumb to critical analysis. For folk who are living it, texts are pervasive behind, under, around all texts of our society and in all its strata, not merely among the rural and the illiterate, the unreflective many. They are everywhere in city and villages, factory and kitchen, Hindu, Buddhist, Jain, Christian, Muslim, king, priest, clown and name it, you would find their per pervasiveness. And this pervasive, pervasiveness becomes more complicated once one attaches to it the contemporary situation. One also has to look at the other kind of possibilities which emerge for the anthropologists by looking at the gaps created by the folklore scholarship. The folklore studies include oral literature, material culture, social folk customs, folk performing arts, the words and phrases like manners, customs, neglected, this, this long list created by almost every folklore scholar has to be revisited so as to figure out as to what all are missing in it in today's time and whether some of those older terms, say for example, custom, say for example, social behavior, are they bearing same meaning as they did a century ago or with the changes in the form of folklore, the connotations have changed too. In order to wrap up this uh, lecture, one has to be reminded that folklore can be simply understood as something that helps in putting forward our clarity and understanding of history. Everyone is associated with some or other folklore. It is often assumed that peasants are a 
community which has a past and its folklore but one also has to realize alongside that outside present society too there could be folklore this is this is this is all about correcting the erroneous belief of bygone times in several accounts of nationalists and elites the peasants are folk that do not have any consciousness towards the existence of nation and nationalism and it is elite folk that take the onus of instilling this understanding within them the nations are thus generally constructed by the nationalists and the elites are merely adopted have merely adopted the passive passivity of the folk however it is doubtful whether folk could be deemed so passively or folk could be deemed to be so passive what we have done in this lecture is that we have dwelt upon the transforming the transformative character of folklore itself which only gets furthermore augmented it gets more accelerated with the intervention from outside in previous lectures also in this course we try to capture the sense of changes which could be spontaneous with folklore the clear boundary between marga the classical and desi the folk that we referred to in one of the earlier lectures perhaps requires a thorough revisiting because of the changes because of the uh, perceived association of both marga and desi with time folklore hence possesses a transformative character of a significant kind which can be best understood by recalling that anecdote which ak ramanujan had shared with us, with us some time ago and the anecdote goes like this a philosopher meets a village carpenter who had a beautiful antique knife when asked about the when asked by the philosopher as to how old the knife was the carpenter says oh the knife has been in our family for generations we have changed the handle a few times and the blade a few times but it is still the same knife the gamut of knowledge held within folklore then becomes priceless loss of this can create major obstacles in any kind of knowledge recovery the exploitation caused to folklore is a major reason for ensuring legal protective measures aspects of folk tales like folk music are more than merely sources of entertainment they act as a mean for recover, recording history through music social history to be more precise the understanding of relation between the written domain of traditions and the oral traditions has been part of folklore studies for long time and that has also started informing anthropologist ever since the beginning of anthropological practices however the change of the nature of this engagement has been under way and that that has to be kept in perspective when one is trying to see the association of folklore and anthropology folklorists focused on newer newer approaches to study these with which did not need any formal theories the focus had been on maintaining an indigenous understanding of folklore much of oral tradition including songs ballads stories so and so forth became available and one tried understanding what among these can be considered to be part of folklore and not just literature when discussing tradition and modern traditional and modern modern the folk gains prime importance alan dunts the folklorist 
held that the folk worldview is not simply men's cosmology. It thus is a way to represent, express and unfold folk view of men, women, groups, communities, societies and so on. And sociology and anthropology adds to this that in addition to these categories, it is also a domain where one should be seeing all novel, all old models of reconciliation and negotiations as in the case of negotiated solidarities, the alternative solidarity that a folklorist such as Gloria Goodwin Raheja referred to. On one hand, it is this kind of solidarity, on the other hand, there is contestation, confrontation, seeking for redefinitions and that characterizing the idea of resistance about which we will hear in the lecture later on. The task of folklorist and social scientists interested in folklore is therefore not so simple. It is not simple telling and retelling of different perspectives. It lies in the hands of the folklorist to provide a creative bent to the existing folklore, else it might be of no interest to anyone. They must raise the folklore to a pedestal which is attractive and charming to all. It is their critical, impartial, comparative and rational analysis that gives credence to the folklore. The folklorist has the responsibility of providing the directive turn As mentioned earlier, the historian becomes a significant figure and along with the historian comes anthropologists and sociologists. In one of the earlier lectures, we had dwelt upon the importance of historian. Here in this lecture, we have dwelt upon the importance of anthropologist as far as making a headway in folklore research, folklore studies is concerned. This lecture is over here. We will continue with some of the issues that we have flagged in the lectures later on. Thank you.